Hallelujah. Praise be to Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's good to be in your church for the first time. It was an hour drive from Tacoma, but it was worthwhile and just, you know, for the worship and the word. So thank you for the, you know, invitation and the warm welcome. I um, come from Slavic Christian Center. Uh, Cornell actually preached at our youth service uh, not too long ago, and we met at a statewide service. Our church is comprised of, um, of, of Slavic people. We have about 30% of, of Russians, about 30% of Ukrainians, about 20% of Romanians, Moldovians, about 10% of Bulgarians, Turkish, and other nationalities. And so it's that is why we are called Slavic Christian Center. I have a, a, a lot of good... Uh, Friends from different cultures, so it's very good to be here, and it's, it means a lot for you know to, for this invitation. So thank you. Today, I'd like to to focus our attention on on the Old Testament. Um, there's a, a place in Scripture. I, I want to be transparent with you. I was preparing to preach another sermon, but I I wanted to. I just I felt the Lord kind of tugging on my heart to preach this sermon, and it's a sermon about Jacob. Uh, Jacob is an interesting character in the Bible because Jacob um, was, um, at least to me, is in stark contrast, his life is a stark contrast to Abraham's and even his father Isaac's life. If you just read through their stories, all had difficulties, all had their moments of, you know, valleys and of uh, high moments in their life. But Jacob's life, like no other life, is a life that is marked by difficulty, by uh, struggles, by fears. And, uh, but Jacob ends his life. There's, in fact, Genesis dedicates the most time to Jacob. Um, then, then more more time to Jacob, I should say, than to Abraham and Isaac combined. Um, and, and and the way that Isaac or Jacob, excuse me, ends his life, it's beautiful. If you ever read, I think I believe it's the forty eighth chapter of Genesis. Jacob is giving his last blessing. It's a prophetic blessing. It's a blessing that looks into the future and and perhaps even sees the Messiah, Jesus Christ, our King. Um, Jacob, though, started um, in a different place. And I want to I want to take us from chapter twenty seven and kind of work through. I'm not going to read these stories, but my main text uh, my main text is going to be from from the middle of Jacob's life. It's Jacob's meeting with God in Genesis chapter thirty two. So let's let's talk about this. Jacob, he uh, was born into a family of twins. It was him and his older brother. And back then, being the younger brother meant um, meant a lot, and being the older brother meant a lot. Because if you were oldest, you received the blessing, you received the inheritance. And so Jacob, he was born second, and he he understood the importance of the blessing, the in, importance of uh, of the inheritance. And so there was a time in chapter twenty seven where he uh, uh, tricks his brother into selling his birthright, or in, in our words, that would be his inheritance, the larger portion of the inheritance that after Isaac's death would belong to Esau. Now Jacob stole, and so the, it, it happened when Esau was very hungry and. He came back and he, the Bible does say that Esau, he rejected his birthright, meaning he didn't see the value in it that Jacob saw. But uh, nonetheless, Jacob, he steals or tricks his brother into, into, into getting this birthright. Um, and then in the same chapter, we read that Isaac, his, his father, prepares to bless his children. Now, the blessing was another part of, of, of what the firstborn would receive. I'm the firstborn, and sometimes I, I wonder why they went away, why, why they took away the blessing and the inheritance, because I would have enjoyed that. But nonetheless, uh, Jacob, he, he, his mother, who was um, kind of closer to Jacob, and the father was closer to Esau, hears Isaac, the father, telling his favorite son, Esau, that I'm going to bless you right now. And she goes and prepares uh, Jacob for a special operation where Jacob is dressed as, a, um, um, as Esau in Esau's clothes. He puts skin on his hands and his neck so that if his father touches him, he feels like Esau. And he, he um, is supposed to come into um, Isaac's tent, and because Isaac is blind, he is supposed to pretend to be Esau, say that I am Esau, I'm here for the blessing, I brought the food that you've asked for, bless me. 
And it's interesting, uh, the Bible doesn't, I'm not going to, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details. The Bible doesn't say that Jacob, he necessarily was against what his mom, his mom was suggesting this operation. In fact, I would say he even, he even, he even bettered the plan because when his mom proposed this plan, he goes, that's a good plan. He didn't say that, but he said, but what if, but I'm, I'm, uh, my brother is a hairy man and I'm, you know, I'm not. And so they, they came up with, with the wool on the neck and on the hands. All that goes to say is that Jacob was searching for something. And I want us to understand that Jacob was searching for something. His entire life, Jacob was after something. He, he felt like he was missing something. And he thought, if I could get this next thing, I will feel good. If I could reach this next goal, I will feel accomplished. And we will see as we walk through Jacob's life how that played out for him. So his, his, he first set his, his eyes on the birthright. And we, I, I've, we've mentioned that he, he's able to trick his brother into giving his birthright. Then he sets his eyes on the blessing and he's able to take the blessing. As we continue through Jacob's life, his mom, um, after this operation succeeds, Jacob is able to steal the blessing. Isaac, uh, their father, is not able to see, and so Isaac acts, well, un unwillingly, not knowingly, blesses Jacob as if he is Esau. And the moment the Bible says that Jacob walked away from the tent, Esau came in. And his father, the Bible says, began, began trembling because he realized that he had blessed the wrong son. He didn't bless his firstborn, he blessed his second. He didn't bless his favorite, he blessed the second. And after that, Esau said, I'm going to kill my brother. After my, my, my dad passes away, I'm going to kill my brother. And so they again uh, prepare this plan where... Um, and, and you could read this for yourself, but I believe the end of chapter 27 or chapter 28, uh, Rachel, or not Rachel, excuse me, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, says, I, I can't stand the wives of Esau. Esau was married to Canaanite women, uh, kind of women that, you know, in the place that they lived around. And uh, she says to her husband, Isaac, send Jacob away to another land so that he can marry there. She said that to, to Jacob, but in her mind, she understood that Esau was planning to kill Jacob. And so this was a good way to get Jacob away from this danger and into a different place. And she said, and then I will call you. She told Jacob, I will call you once, um, once everything kind of uh, dies down. And so Jacob, it says he begins to, to run away, you could say, to this, to, to, to this other land. And um, it says the Bible, in, in the Bible it says that an, an angel, or before the angel, it says that um, he, he went to sleep and he saw a, a staircase. And on the staircase, he saw uh, angels going up and going down the staircase. And then the Bible says that he saw God standing on top of the staircase. In other translations, it says that God was now suddenly standing beside Jacob. And God begins to bless Jacob. God says, you received this, this, this thing that you were after, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to bless your inheritance, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to give you the land. And he, 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 he states a couple of blessings that we don't have time to get into, and that is not the point of the sermon. Uh, Jacob, he has this dream. He wakes up, and he says, truly, this is the house of God. And he names this place Bethel, which means house of God. He erects a pillar. And he puts oil on it, and he says, God, he tells God after this dream, if you bring me back from this land that I'm going to, and if you give me food to eat and clothes to wear, and if you keep me safe, you will be my God, and of everything that you give me, I will give you a tenth. He makes God a promise. And then he, he goes away into uh, the land of his fathers, um, where Abraham came from. It's interesting that as he comes into this land, um, you, can once again see, you can once again see the providence of God because he meets um, a couple of shepherds by a well. 
And uh, he, he asked these men, I'm, I'm sure he wasn't, he wasn't too sure where he was going. He knew that he was going towards his family, his distant relatives, Laban, who was his uncle, Rebecca's brother, his, his mom's brother. And so he was going towards Laban's house, and he, he was going to marry in that land. And, and he meets a couple of shepherds, and, and you can right away see how smart Jacob was. How, how intelligent, because he begins to ask him very interesting questions. This, this man, he says, why aren't you watering the sheep right now? First of all, he says, you know, are you, are you well? He greets them. And then he, he begins to inquire, uh, why aren't you watering the sheep right now? And they go, well, because um, it's, not, it's not time. Everyone usually gathers their sheep. Then we, we take off, you know, the lid from the well, and then we water the sheep. And uh, he, he listens to that. He also asks about, do you know Laban, my uncle? And they say, yeah, we know Laban. In fact, here comes Rachel, his daughter, um, to the well, um, and, and she's a shepherdess. And so you can see this kind of uh, interesting meaning where he meets Rachel. And when it says when he meets Rachel, he, begins to, he, he kisses her, he begins to cry. He, re, he sees God's leading in his life. He senses that God, is, that God is kind of providing everything. He's brought him to the right place. He's, 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 he sees Rachel, he sees the sheep, and it says he begins to cry. And then uh, his intelligence is kind of uncovered where he goes, he goes uh, to the well, he opens the well up, and he begins to water Rachel's, or Laban's, I should say, sheep. Um, he waters all of them. And later on in life, if you study the life of Jacob, he becomes a very good professional when it comes to raising flocks, when it comes to raising sheep. It says that he became exceedingly or very, very rich. And, and Laban knew that he was smart with sheep and he understood that he was good with doing this. So he was a smart man. He knew how to get what he wanted. It's not like he wasn't, you know, didn't have the effort. He had the effort to get things done in life. He had the, the intelligence, you know, he was smart. But, but here's, here's the problem. He was, still, he was still searching for something. So we, we then see that Rachel runs and gets Laban, her dad. Laban comes out, meets Jacob. And, and when Jacob, it says, tells him the story of his life, Laban says, truly, you are my flesh, or we are of one blood. Meaning, maybe, I don't know, maybe he heard, you know, the, the, how smart Jacob was with getting the blessing, with getting the birthright. I don't know, but somehow he realized that this is my relative. We are of one blood. He says, come live with me. And for a month, Jacob and Laban and that whole family is living together in unity and peace and everything is wonderful in Jacob's life. Everything is wonderful in Jacob's life. And so then Laban asks uh, Jacob, Jacob, I don't want you to serve me for nothing. What can I pay you? You've been working for me for a month. What can I pay you? And Jacob goes, I want to marry one of your daughters. And so he works, and, and they make an agreement. Seven years working for, uh, for one of uh, Laban's daughters. And again, uh, you could see how, how Jacob, he, he's blessed even in this, because all oh, those seven years, the Bible writes, they passed as a few days. Meaning he wasn't, it wasn't something that he was dreading. He, could, he, he sees another goal. He sees that he needs to marry someone. So he's going towards that as well. And, and then something happens. During, during uh, the wedding, he gets tricked into marrying the, the wrong uh, person, the wrong girl. And so he then has to work another seven years for, to marry the person that he wanted, to marry Rachel. And, and things begin to change in Jacob's life. This is a, a, a very pivotal moment in Jacob's life because uh, before, where, when he received the birthright, when he received the blessing, he had certain goals in his life. He was going towards those goals and, and he was reaching them. And now in his life, he's seeing that something is going, something is going off there. He's being tricked. Um, then we read um, after some time that he begins to r see that the, 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 um, he's, he's, he's worked for his, his, his first wife. He's worked for his second wife. But now he wants to add, you know, to his possessions. He wants to build a little bit of wealth. And so he, said, he tells Laban, I'm leaving. I'm going back to my father's house because um, I, I want to go home. And I want to probably, he probably said, I want to, you know, build my own business. And I see that your business is strong, but I want to build my own. And Laban says, no, 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 stay with me. Stay with me. Um, whatever you, you say, I will give you because I see that God blesses me because of you. 
And so uh, Jacob, he says, okay, I will work for you if you give me all the, the flock that is spotted or speckled or striped, meaning in what, how I understand this, and I might be wrong. By the way, some of these gaps I'm just filling in. I'm just filling in the story. You can come up to me after servants and say, Andre, you said this wrong, and I'll take it. I'll, like, I, I, will, I want to learn better about Jacob. But, but here's the interesting thing. Uh, he, it seems like he takes the flocks that are, are weaker, that are inferior, that are somehow blemished. Even if you remember God, when he was asking for sacrifices, he said that the sacrifice cannot have a blemish. It needs to be a, a good sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice. Well, Jacob goes for the sheep that are weaker, but he has a plan. Again, he, Jacob has a plan. And Jacob's plan is that transform those weak sheep into stronger sheep. And it's a, it's a very interesting story as you read how he begins to do that. He begins to take, um, during certain times, he begins to uh, uh, put certain things in the water so that the sheep would drink it. And the Bible says when they, would, when they would look at these things, or some say drink the water that these special pieces of wood were in, they would uh, give birth to spotted and speckled and striped sheep. And he would do this only when the strong sheep were giving birth and not when the weak sheep. And so now you see Jacob's wealth is building and Laban's wealth is decreasing. And soon Laban begins to realize, I'm losing money here. I'm losing sheep. All the strong sheep are Jacob's. All the weak sheep are mine. It says that uh, Laban's sons, they begun, begin to grumble about Jacob and they say, we don't like our cousin Jacob anymore because he's becoming, he's, he's, too, he's too rich now and he took our dad's wealth and he made it his own. And Jacob begins to feel this pressure. And so he, he now, look at this, it has the birthright. He has the blessing. Jacob now has the um, wealth that uh, he wanted. He's married. At this point, Jacob has eleven children. All the children that we know, all the patri or the yeah, the, the patriarchs, the tribes up until um, Joseph. And he, at this point, has been twenty years in a different land, and he's ready to go back home. Especially now that God has shown himself in a dream and says, Jacob, return back home. And so Jacob begins his journey back home. But here's the problem with the journey back home. Is that Esau, the brother that he tricked, is still back at home. And he's going to have to come back, yes, with his wealth, with his wives and his children, but face his brother. And so he begins the journey as the journey, uh, you know, as he, he, he picks a perfect time uh, when, when Laban, his uncle, was three days away from him. And he gathers everyone together and he, he moves away with all of his wealth. Laban hears about it and begins to chase after Jacob. And it takes, uh, Laban ten days. It takes Laban ten days in order to, uh, to catch up to Jacob. Now, uh, here's an interesting point. Laban is an interesting character because Laban is like family. Or I should say Laban is family. And so, if, if, if you think of Laban, Laban, in a sense, he, he likes Jacob, and Jacob likes Laban. But a point, uh, a t a point in, li in the life of Jacob came when he realized that he can't live with Laban anymore. He needs, to, he needs to separate from Laban. He needs to separate from the practices of Laban. He needs to separate from the gods of Laban. He needs to go to a new country, his, his father's house. And it, 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 it sometimes is like that in our Christian walk, especially that we live in Washington State and we, we live in a country that is progressive. And sometimes you look at the culture, you look at the things in the world around us, and it feels so close to us because we were born in it. This, this was some, you know, the, 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 the things that the world offers. I'm not talking about outright sin. I'm talking about the gray area. But I believe in our life, there, there comes a time where we have to uh, dedicate ourselves to God, where we have to separate from the world and say, Lord, we're going to go away from that which is close to us, but that which does not bring us closer to you. And if you're calling us to a different land, we'll go there. And so Jacob is going to another land, his father's home. Laban is about to catch up to him. And the ninth night, as Laban is chasing Jacob, something happens. God reveals himself to Laban. 
God shows, uh, somehow shows himself to Laban and says, do not speak to Jacob, either good or evil. He warns him. And so on the 10th day, then he meets uh, Jacob. And, and the first thing he asks is, what did you do to me? Why did you run away? Why didn't you tell me? Now, question to you. Um, he, he says um, that I would have, I would have um, let you go with, with songs and with timbrels, meaning musical instruments. I would have thrown a party, he basically says, for you. I would have let you go, I would have, and I would have been happy. But, you know, again, Jacob wasn't a, a foolish man. Jacob was a smart person. And I think Jacob sensed that, you know, if he were to tell Laban, that, hey, I am leaving you right now. You know, let's make some kind of a deal. It, things wouldn't go too well. He maybe remembered the last party that Jacob threw for him. If you guys remember, seven years into his being with Jacob, for those of you who know who the Bible, you guys, you guys know what I'm talking about. It wasn't a good party. Jacob got tricked. And so he's understanding this is not, um, this is something, this is a separation that cannot have compromises. I, and, and sometimes when it comes to the world, we can't negotiate. When it comes to separating from the world, we can't sit down and say, well, let's see, what can we take of yours and what can we give? You know, let's make some kind of a deal. No, sometimes we have to make a run for it. Sometimes we have to separate ourselves and says, from this day on, I'm moving out. And that is what Jacob did. Jacob, he uh, is now talking with Laban and Laban says, why did you trick me? Why did you steal my daughters? My grandchildren didn't tell me. And then he says, why did you steal my gods? Here's another problem. Jacob's wife, Rachel, she stole Laban's gods, idols, little idols. And um, Laban was not happy about that. And because Rachel stole her, uh, his, her, her father's idols, Laban had the authority now to walk into every tent of, La of, of Jacob. He walked into Jacob's tent into his wife's tents, and he turned, it says he looked through everything in order to find those idols, simply because something that didn't belong in a, in a patriarch's home, idols were in that home. You know, sometimes we allow the enemy, Lord help us, Lord give us mercy, but sometimes we allow the enemy to have a certain kind of contact with our lives, simply because we allow things that should not be in our lives to be in our lives. And he's able, he's able to, sometimes, to sometimes kind of do things in our lives that are not permitted for him to do had we been walking with God. God help us. May we be strong in God. May we be, may we be strong in our walk with, with God to stand um, firm on, on God's commandments, on God's way of living life. But here comes the interesting story, uh, part of the story. Laban, he goes, I could, I could hurt you. He tells Jacob, I could hurt you. An uncle telling his nephew. An uncle telling someone who's married his daughters, I could hurt you. In other translations, I could destroy you. He says, but God showed himself to me and told me, do not say either good or bad to you. God is with Jacob. And so even though Jacob is making mistakes, listen to this, even though Jacob is making mistakes in his life, even though Jacob is, is uh, attaining things, not through God, but out of his, by his own effort, by his own power, God is still with Jacob. God is still protecting him. God is still sovereign over his life. And God is still leading him somewhere, namely back to his father's home. They make a covenant. And here, Laban, he begins to feel something. He begins to feel that the tables have churned. This isn't the Jacob that came to him. This is a different Jacob. He's now seen the blessing of God on Jacob's life. He's seen that Jacob has grown in wealth, that Jacob has so many children, that Jacob will be blessed in the future, that he will be a patriarch. And he says, let's make a covenant right here. Let's, let's put, a, let's put a, a sign. And I'm not going to you know, uh, go to you to hurt you, but you won't be able to come to me and hurt me. And, and here's the question. Do you think that... Um, uh, Sorry, I keep on turning this thing. Jacob, J uh, uh, if, if Laban was there with Jacob, um, and if he didn't hurt Jacob there, because God revealed himself to him, do you think Laban would have went across this long journey and, and hurt himself? Probably, I don't think so. 
I don't think so. Because at that point, he already realized, I'm not touching you. I'm going through your stuff, but I'm not touching you. But something interesting happens. He says, but Jacob, I'm not going to cross over to hurt you, but you don't come over here to, uh, and, and cross over this monument to hurt me. He realizes that th- something can go down. He re- realizes the blessing of God, and he realizes that God's blessing is so strong in his life, this is not someone I want to reckon with. This is not someone I want to deal with if, as an enemy. And, and this is what happens in our life when we dedicate ourselves to God. When we say, Lord, we want to seek you with all of our hearts, we want to seek you with all of our minds, the enemy begins to sense that, I think. I think the, uh, the enemy begins to sense that uh, God's blessing is on our life. God's, God's victory is on our life. And the enemy will take a step back in Jesus' name. Amen. Jacob continues on to his uh, father's house. And after this great victory, you could say, with Laban, he feels good. He's walked away from, 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 the, you know, from his uncle Laban. He sends messengers over to his brother Esau, and he says, Esau, I'm coming home. And Esau, he begins to build a certain kind of a little army, you can say. The messengers, they come back to uh, Jacob, and they say, Jacob, we told your brother that you're coming back. And now he's coming back, and there are 400 men with him. And it says that Jacob became afraid and was terrified. He was, a, he was scared because, I mean, who walks out with 400 people to meet someone, to, to say hello to someone, you know? And, and um, my, it doesn't matter what I think. I don't think that Esau would have hurt him. But what does matter is this, that Isaac or Jacob begins to pray to God. And right there, right then, he says a prayer to God. He says, Lord, you're the one who told me to go back to you. You're the one who told me to seek you. You're the one who told me to to go back to the land of my fathers. And so I'm going back to the place that you told me. And now there's my brother coming with 400 people. What am I to do? Lord, bless me. Lord, help me. And there he gets an idea to uh, send gifts to his to his brother and he sends a lot of gifts uh, to his brother maybe he heard that uh, Isaac's or, or, or he understood or remembered that Esau's um, love language was gifts I don't know but he starts sending gifts and after to every person he says as you go say I am right behind him say say that all these flocks are for my my lord Esau and that Jacob is right behind these gifts And so he sends these gifts away, and he camps there that night. And then something happens. I believe this was, that that the pivotal moment was not only when Jacob was wrestling, as we were singing with God, but something happened where Jacob makes a, a step of faith. He says, God, God has been leading me in my life. I felt it. I've seen so many instances. At one time, he was telling Laban when they were arguing, when Laban caught up to him, he says, Laban, you tricked me 10 times. 10 times Laban tricked him. And he says, in all those times, God would bless me. He, Jacob realizes God was leading him in his life, intricately, beautifully, leading him closer to him, clo- back to his father's home. And he says, he says, um, he, and I, I think he makes a big step here. The Bible says that he takes all his household and he sends them across a river towards Esau. So here's Jacob's camp. Here's the river. And Esau is coming with 400 men this way. He takes all of his, uh, all of his people and sends them across uh, this river. Now, to us, a river is like, you know, it's like what, you know, we think of swimming or uh, water river, uh, river rafting, you know, fun things. But rivers back then were a big deal. If you read any, you know, history, you'll know that armies, entire big Roman armies would be stopped by rivers or they would, rivers would complicate the way that they had to do things. This was a big headache to the best generals. How do you get an army across the river safely? Because rivers have currents and rivers are unpredictable. And so this was a lot of work that Jacob was putting to get his people across to the other side. But think about this if he's putting in a lot of work to get his people across to the other side towards Esau then he's going to have to put a lot of work to get his people across back if he's running away from Esau 
Uh, because at, at one point he had separated his camp into two camps and he said if Esau talks one camp the other camp will be able to run away he had camels he had animals he was thinking if Esau does attack me with his 400 soldiers there might be a chance that some will run away but by taking all of his people and by sending him across the river he makes a statement he makes a, a decision he shows God his decision that I believe your promises I see that you're leading me in my life. I see that you're leading me into a certain point, and I accept your will for my life. I accept your doing in my life. I am sending all my people over, and perhaps the last person that he sent over was oh, his, you know, Rachel and Joseph. He made the raft, or they made the raft, send him over, and the Bible says he was left alone in the camp it's Jacob and nobody else on this side of the river everyone's on that side on the same side that Esau is and so Jacob is alone you can if you could just imagine Jacob's heartache if you could can, can imagine Jacob's fear if you can imagine Jacob's realization uh, from the one side he realizes God is doing something in my life God told me to go back to my father's land he showed me in a dream but from the other side, he realizes, I just sent all my people across the river. Esau is coming with 400 men. I don't know if he's friendly or not friendly to me. What am I to do? And the Bible says that someone fought with him. In the Russian, uh, that's, um, in, in the English, it says one. I, I don't know many languages, but I can read Russian a little bit. It says nekta. Nyekta just means somebody. It's the same word uh, a couple of times is used in the Bible also to uh, underline characters in the Bible that are very intriguing. Like when Joseph was lost in the field, it says that someone met him and said, oh, you're lost, your brothers went that way. And so what happens is someone meets Jacob. Now when humans meet the divine, they feel it. And I believe that the moment that he met this someone, it wasn't a fight, at least in my mind. Forgive me if I'm wrong. I don't think it was a fight where he was, you know, struggling or really, you know, wrestling with the angel. The Bible in Hosea says pretty clearly that he was begging and pleading with God. The Bible says that the angel said, let go of me, meaning like, like don't hold on to me. Maybe he was holding on to his leg or something. But the Bible says that there was a fight between Jacob and this someone. And Jacob just wanted one thing. He wanted God's blessing. And Jacob had just experienced the most important thing. He had finally met God. And his life was going to be different from this moment on. His name was going to be changed. It was going to be no longer that Jacob fights for things in his life that Jacob makes the way for his life, but that God fights for him. And the Bible says, and I want to read to you, Genesis chapter 32, verse 22. I'm finishing up. During the night, Jacob got up, took his two wives, his two servant wives, and his 11 sons crossed the Jabbok River with them. And taking them to the other side, he sent over all his possessions. This ja left Jacob alone in the camp. A man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he could not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of his socket. Then the man said, let me go for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob. And he said, your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied, then he blessed Jacob there. Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. And verse 31, the sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel, and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. And so you see that as Jacob is moving away from his father's house, the, it says that the sun set down and Jacob went down to sleep. And then he walked into this foreign land. And when Jacob is returning back home, it says that the sun is rising now. And Jacob is now walking with a limp towards Esau. Jacob has met with God and something happened. I believe that it, it's marked by the name that Jacob is given Israel. 
Israel mean, means God fights. Jacob means supplanter or heel grabber. Heel grabber, I don't know if you've ever done this to someone, to, to a friend or not, but if you've put your foot, when you were kids, someone's running and you put a, you know, your foot as someone is running by, and it, all it takes is a little touch of their foot on your foot and they fall over. It, it, it means to kind of take the foot and, and, and try to, you know, trick someone or supplant someone. Basically, take them and, you know, turn them around. But Jacob's name is now changed. It's no longer that Jacob is going to be fighting. God is going to be fighting for him. And so this is my sermon. This is my sermon. Perhaps you've been sitting in, uh, in this service, and perhaps throughout your life, you, as I have, been fighting for certain things. Fighting for victory in your life over certain sins. Perhaps you've been fighting with certain temperaments. You know, depression comes on you or anxiety comes upon you. And what can a person do? I mean, you can take only so much medication. You can, you can walk for only so long. But what can you do? A time comes when God says, let me do that for you. Let, let me set you free from the sin. Let, let me free you from anxiety. Let me set you free from worry. Let me fight. Let me fight. You've been fighting all your life, and it's hard, it's difficult. You have ups and you have downs, and the downs are very low. So it takes a long to, to get up. But let me fight for you. Let me lead your life. Let me take the reins. But what it takes is a step of faith. And today I would encourage you today, if this is you, to take that step of faith. In your mind, say, Lord, as Jacob crossed the river with all his things and that left him alone for God to meet with him, I want to make a step. I want to make a step and give all of my life into your hands so that I am left alone with you. I want to meet with you today. Lord, what is your will for my life? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? And is there anything in my life that is not pleasing to you? Lord, you see that I'm fighting with these things. Lord, help me. I'm tired of fighting these things. Lord, you see the sin in my life. I'm tired of the sin in my life. Lord, you see my unforgiveness. I'm tired of my unforgiveness. Lord, help me. And look what happens when a person makes that step in their heart to say, Lord, I give you my life. I want to seek you now. Something happens. God meets with you. As God met with Jacob, God meets with these people. And he says, I want to speak something to you. You are now Israel. I will now fight for you. God fights. May God's name be glorified. Hallelujah. I want to invite you to prayer. And let's, let's stand. Let's ask God. May this be our prayer. God, please take over my life. Take over my uh, uh, weaknesses. I give you my life so that I could live for you. Let's pray. Lord, we worship you. God, we glorify your name. We give you praise and honor and glory, my God. And Lord, you see that in our lives, my God, sometimes we try to do things, my God. Sometimes we try to, to get to certain places, free ourselves from certain sins sins, my God. But today we say, Lord, you fight. Lord, you, you do your will in our lives. Lord, may your name be glorified. May you, Lord, may your name be praised in our lives. No longer we who live, my God, but you live, my God, through us. Lord, may your name be glorified. And may your name be praised. May your name be honored. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Blessed be your name. We worship you, Jesus. We glorify your name, Jesus. And today, my God, we want to make a commitment to you, my God. Today, my Lord, if you have been struggling, if we have been struggling with certain sins, today we want to make a commitment. Lord, we no longer can do this by ourselves. We give our lives into your hands. If we have been struggling with fear and anxiety, we can no longer do this ourselves. We give our lives over to you. Me with us, Lord. Me with us, Lord. Lord, on this side of the Jabbok, meet with us, Lord, and give us a new name, and give us the name Israel, Lord, and give us your blessing, my Lord. We ask in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.